Thanks for listening to Exploring the Wine Glass Podcast, the podcast for people who love wine. I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program and WSET Level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. Welcome to another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening in. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review to help others find the podcast. The Carriania Denomination de Origin, or DO, is situated about halfway between Madrid and Barcelona and was created in 1932, making it one of the oldest protected wine regions in Europe. Vineyards with the Carriania region range from 400 meters above sea level to about 800 meters in the Sierra de la Virgen Mountains. Of the four DOs located in the region of Aragon, Carignania is the largest. Carignania DO is in the northeast region of the country and is not only the geographical name, but also the grape itself, although possibly more commonly known as Carignan. Carignania is no longer the most planted grape in the region. That honor is now held by Garnacha which is believed to also have its origins in this region. I had the privilege to sit in on a Zoom virtual tasting sponsored by Gregory and Vine to discuss the wines of the region. Oh, and yeah, of course I got to drink some exceptional wine. My sample was from Bodegas Paniza, who produces single varietal wines representing the best terroirs of the region. You can find out more about this wine on my Instagram feed. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did, and trust me when I tell you that Carignania is definitely a region to watch and such an incredible value. So you know it's now time to unscrew, uncork, or saber a bottle, and let's virtually visit Carignania. I'm Trish Haywood. I'm with Gregory and Fine. I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. We've seen a few of you over the last month. I hope everybody's hanging in there. Um, hope you're not drinking quite as much as me. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'd like to, we have with us today, uh, Kat Thomas and Rick Fisher. And yes, two of our favorite wine educators. So um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Kat. Kat is based in Las Vegas. Uh, she was the, she's uh, the head of wine training education at, for the Hakkasan group. Um, she's got a great following too on uh, Instagram. You can find her at um, this uh, wine goddess LV for Las Vegas. Um, and we've got uh, Kat recently went to the region. She was in Carignana in last July, was it? July, August? September. September, yeah. Um, okay. And, uh, and Rick, uh, Rick is uh, the Spanish wine guy, also very active on Instagram. And Rick is um, about two years ago, he left his job in banking to pursue his passion, um, in particularly in Spanish wine. And he heads up the Spanish wine, the Spanish program for the Wine Scholar Guild. He uh, worked very hard on the um, curriculum for that and the textbook, and they have done extremely well. And how many educators do you have now, Rick? Uh, educators for Spanish Wine Scholar, uh, we have about 50 or 60, but we've had about 400 people already going through the program. Um, so, and it's it's not even, I mean, we just officially launched in October of last year, so... It's yeah. Great. And Kat's one of our Kat's one of our instructors as yeah. well. Great. Um, and Rick was supposed to be in Carniana about a month ago. Three weeks ago, yeah. Three weeks ago. <laughs> but unfortunately, we had to cancel that trip. What did we cancel it about a week before? I think. Uh, uh, it was yeah. a few weeks before that. <laughs> yeah. So. Ooh, hot. So I am going to turn it over to you guys. I assume everybody got their wine. Yes. 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 Great. Yes. Should we start with a toast though before we do that? <laughs> I didn't even. I had it. 
Yeah, mine's so kava, so it's particularly yeah. appropriate. Ooh. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here in a couple seconds. Um, as Trish said, um, I am uh, the Spanish Wine Scholar Education Director for the Wine Scholar Guild, for those of you. Um, I do have a couple of friends on here. I see Lisa. Nice to see Lisa. Great to see that you recovered from Corona. Um, welcome back. Thank you. And uh, so, um, and I see some names that I that I'm very familiar with here, and looking forward to getting to know some of you guys. Other ones. Um, I have a love for Spanish wine, and I, if I go too long, Trish will put the hook on me and pull me away. So um, we're gonna we're gonna actually start off here. I'm gonna share my screen and get us going on a fun little presentation that we have. Oh, oh wow. I know, how fun, huh? I mean, this is this is not a second class organization. This is top notch. And and you know, seriously, anybody, if anybody wants to jump in, if you have a question, um, please feel free to do so. Um, it's uh, this is this is a happy hour. It's meant to be fun and enjoy ourselves. And you know, we want to throw a little bit of education in everybody's way. But at the end of the day, it's all about getting together and having a drink. So. Um, as you can see, we are in the Carignana virtual happy hour. Uh, Kat is wine goddess uh, at wine goddess LV, and I am at the Spanish wine guy, both Instagram and both there for us. And uh, no trip to a wine region would be complete without gratuitous pictures of what we cannot see and what we all long for right now um, in getting to getting back into wine country. And um, so I figured it would be kind of fun just to throw these um, to throw these picks in here for you guys. So uh, I know a lot of you guys are educators and you're writers, and so some of this uh, may be review for you. Uh, but just to kind of get started here, so this uh, a couple of maps from actually from our Spanish Wine Scholar program. Uh, here you see uh, everybody knows Spain, the best wine country in the world. Um, I'm muting everybody so I can't get any any feedback on that comment. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, but no, so you see Spain here, um, Aragon, uh, bordering Catalonia over in the eastern part of the country, and then you can see um, in the cutout of Aragon as well, Carignana is nestled right in there with all of these other wine regions um, in Aragon. It is actually uh, the oldest wine region in, in Aragon, and it's one of the oldest wine regions in Spain. It was one of the original 19 uh, wine regions that was designated in the 1932 wine statute. Uh, so a very, very old um, and historic region. And interestingly enough, Dio Carignana is the only uh, region in the world that is officially, that has its appellation named after a grape variety. Um, and originally, when Rio Spicius was coming into play, uh, they were actually uh, trying to dick to name as Alvarino, but but at the time that you would allow that, and so uh, they are now Rio Spicius. But Carignana, the only one in the world. All right, so um, here this is a a um, so I think that we all have wines from uh, one of three different wineries. Uh, this uh, photo here is actually from Bodegas San Valero, and. Um, uh, just a couple of fun historical things about Carignana, which I find fascinating. Uh, back in the early 15th century, uh, King Ferdinand actually put the wines of Carignana on a preferred list of uh, supplies that he wanted to take on a trip to Nice with him. And <laughs> I mean, isn't it crazy? Like, I mean, seriously, but of course, he's the, he's the king of Spain. The first thing he probably put on the list you know, was wine. Second thing was olive oil. Third thing was a really good Hamoni Baracole, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they've written about this wine uh, region. They've written about the wines from here. Uh, even in up in uh, 1809, um, it was written that there was an exquisite wine, particularly known as Grenache, uh, that was made in the Carignano wine region. So, uh, just kind of fun to see how how his how much history there is here. As you can see, more pictures, gratuitous pictures of Carignana in the, of course, winter. Kidding, fall. Um, 
So the region here is uh, fairly high elevation. Um, much of Spain is, is high elevation, especially uh, in the center and in, on the outside parts of the Meseta. Uh, here, the vineyards range anywhere from 1,300 up to 2,600 uh, feet. And, and rainfall is actually fairly low. It's, it's low to moderate from between about 14 to 20 inches a year. Um, soils, we're going to look at some soil types here, but predominantly brown limestone and some slate and clay and some really, really cool rocky soils. Um, there's one picture in here that is just absolutely spectacular. Um, and then this region, you know, you see it where it's located in the northern part of Spain, uh, very close to, to Rioja as well. There's a wind that comes down from France called the Cierzo wind, which is, which is a, a dry cooling wind uh, and helps to push out some of the warmth in the region and helps to extend the growing season. So here you can see um, some old vines, some new vines, old training methods. On the left is the Gobelet or Envaso in Spain, as they call it. And then on the right, you see some VSP trained vines. Uh, in Spain, they call it Espaldera. And uh, you can see a little bit of the variety of the soils here. But uh, when we actually start looking here, this is the picture that I think is super, super cool. And I love the aspect of this picture. Um, I live in San Diego and uh, go to Northern California frequently or in the past. And, uh, you know, it's funny looking at these vines. These are like these gnarled up old Zinfandel vines from, uh, from Lodi. And, uh, but the soils look nothing like that. And so these rocky, rocky soils that help to, you know, help to, to trap the heat and also help to reflect the sunlight um, on, on the vines here. And so absolutely incredible variety. Um, and, and as we talk through, I think everybody, you know, as you have these different wines, then, um, you know, if you've looked at tech sheets or whatnot, you kind of see where, where, this, where, they're, where, they, uh, where they're growing here. Uh, the, interestingly enough as well, Carignana in Spain, their campaign in Spain is Viña de las Piedras. So the vines of the rocks, vines of the stones. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, this is, you know, a point of positivity for them. They're very proud of, of this, uh, of these this soil type and, and growing in, uh, in the production of their wine. And here you can see, again, a little bit more of a close-up of some of these rocks and then some of these more, uh, some of the more uh, brown, brown limestone, red clay uh, type soils as well. Um, and I think that um, some of you have been to the region. And as we go through and we start tasting especially, please don't hesitate to share some of your experiences um, as well. Now, um, I figured that it would be kind of interesting to throw this in because as a Spanish wine educator, I'm always fascinated by what grapes grow where. And, you know, uh, Aragon is is home to Garnacha. It is it, you know, some of the most, some of the best Garnacha in the world comes from this region. But this little this little wine region, Carignana, is really diverse. And you can see here from this chart uh, the largest percentage. Um, and, and not much above uh, Tempranillo is Garnacha. Gotcha. But then you look, their third produced grape is Cab and, and then Shiraz. And then the grape Carignana, the namesake of the region, is at 5%. And there's a lot of international varieties grown in, uh, in Aragon because during Phylloxera, when the French winemakers were escaping France, they came across the border and they were coming into places like Aragon and Navarra and Rioja, and even into parts of Castilla Leon and Catalonia. And so you do see a lot of influence of international grapes here in the region. So Garnacha, uh, I think you guys are probably uh, understand and, and know Garnacha fairly well. Um, I always uh, tell people, I always remind people when I'm talking to my educators and talking to my students that that uh, it's it's Garnacha before Grenache because this is a Spanish grape. It is this, it is home here in Spain, and uh, the French just do a much better job at marketing than the Spaniards than the Spanish do. And so everybody calls it Grenache, even on the tech sheet that I'm looking at from one of the wineries, they put Grenache instead of Garnacha. But we'll save that uh, bone of contention for another time. Uh, so it, it thrives in, in really warm climates, which is why it does so well here. Um, you know, the colors tend to be a little bit lighter uh, with really, you know, a medium to medium plus type of acidity, medium to high alcohol. And 
it's really used in a variety of styles, uh, all the way from really light, fresh rosados, all the, you know, into really um, to to vino tinto. And I think that you know one of the th the th fun things I like about this grape is that it, I think it is a fairly diverse grape. And I think what you're starting to see now as well as 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 uh, winemakers are really looking to try to get um, a little bit move away from some of those super high alcohol wines is they're starting to harvest a little bit sooner to try to retain some of the freshness and some of the acidity um, that's in this grape. Uh, other obviously other. Uh, Grape varieties are, are grown here. Uh, here on the left uh, are some Macabeo vines. Again, also in Vaso, uh, the vines here, uh, the Garnacha vines are some of the oldest in, in all of Spain. Um, and here again, obviously, you know, these old planting methods and Covale method here uh, for Macabeo. And then on the right, I think, I believe that's uh, Garnacha Blanca. Not, not, I mean, and, and not a super, super, um, you know, massively grown grape in the region. Again, most of this region is is red. All right, so I am going to turn this over to Kat now. And Kat, who uh, was in the region, I uh, believe you said it was last year, um, is going to share a little bit more about some of the ins and outs of the region and, and some of the fun stuff that goes on there. So Kat, it's all yours. All right. So I hope you're all indulging and drinking a coffee chat. We'll get to some of those higher alcohol percentages and why that's normal for the region. Um, so Bodega San Valero, uh, one of the three main cooperatives in the area, along with Grandes Vinos and um, Anita. So Bodega San Valero, really just one of the, the outstanding um uh, co-ops there because they were the oldest winery in Catania, founded in 1944. Now that doesn't sound like that long ago, but they were constructed in 1944 as a group of winemakers of 60 different winemakers that came together. And then now it's over 500 winemakers in that tiny little area that are working harmoniously, mostly together to create different wines and kind of send them out into the world. Um, for the longest time, since 1944, they focus on indigenous varieties, uh, which accounts for probably around 70% of all their plantings. Um, we're going to find out really the statistics, hopefully, for you. But it's it's about 70% of all their plantings, and um, they're they're really starting to play around with some international varieties such as Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Merlot, which some of you are tasting. Um, and I know that a couple of the beautiful humans on this uh, panel were actually on this trip with me. Um, they might pop up even on this. Um, so really some fun facts that we can talk about. The Garnacha, Grenache, um, some of the oldest vines. Now, they'll say that they're anywhere between 30 to 45 years of age. We actually got to see vines that were at least 100 years of age. Now, what does that mean for the, the actual production? You can't produce a lot of wine. So, and you have to hand harvest everything because everything's a bush vine, right? So, or en basso. Um, but I think personally, and this of course will be something that I wanna ask everybody on the panel, when you get something with that much age, and, and I say wisdom on this beautiful little hippie dippy Earth Day, when you get something with that age and that wisdom and that structure, it really can produce such a fabulous wine. And I'd love to hear from you all about that. So 20% of the Garnacha is classified as Vina Viejas. Now there isn't a definitive in the EU, but typically we learn that it's somewhere between 35 years of age plus. Um, so 30 to 100 years is kind of the, the realm that we find that in. Uh, these vines are all at higher elevations and they're found in this wonderful soil. So I actually, and, and Ellie, I know that you actually found this beautiful rock. And if you can see this, it's shaped like a heart. How cool is that? But these big, beautiful rocks are found all over. And this is just a tiny parcel of of these high elevation stones. So up on this Monte Bouquet, this is where these extreme conditions for El Vino de las Piedras, so these are the, the, the vines and the, the stony soils, the, the wines from these stony soils, 
where you find some of the oldest vines and to me some of the best wines that come out of there. There's four types of, of soils here. I could rattle them off, but I'd rather send it to you if you if you have interest in it because I want to get to you guys talking about it. But that's where you're finding most of these big pudding stones, those galets that you find in like Walla Walla and in Chateauneuf de Proof. So um, we're going to talk about some more of the winery visits, um, which I think I'd really like to extend that to my my homies that were there with me as well, because what I experienced there was kind of like eyes wide open. We came out of Zaragoza. We took like an hour long ride in these buses, tortured Stephanie, who was our, our, our captain and uh, our host there. And when you get to these high elevation vineyards, you're walking back in time, you're walking back in history and you walk up these little paths and there is this beautiful open space. And some of these wineries are definitely moving in with their technology. They're modernizing clean, beautiful facilities and you're still feeling this heritage of these small families bringing their grapes, the co-ops are making the wine, and there's a connection from the past and the future coming and fusing into the present. Um, that's what I got from each winery. Now, granted, there is a difference, say, like at Panisa, and you'll see a picture in one of the slides where there's this uptake of modern technology and modern architecture definitely coming through as a, as a difference from some of the other wineries that we got to visit. But each one of them had this connection with the past and still trying to figure out where they wanted to go in the future. We were treated with uh, the utmost kind of like family feel. They welcomed us with open arms. The foods were, were pretty astonishing. If you like vegetables, though, be aware that each vegetable has a hunk of meat either wrapped around it or shoved somewhere inside of it. Um, that was kind of fun for me. Um, what else can we talk about? I really want to hear from you guys, um, but let's just real quick, those three uh, co-ops that we were talking about, the Grandes Vinos. So they were actually founded more recently in 1997, but they are a co-op that was formed between the 50s and the 60s. Um, they started with only seven members and now they have 700 grower families. It's pretty cool that there's such a small region that actually has that many uh, families kind of wanting to support. Um, they have 1,100 acres of vines that kind of range in that 1,100 all the way up to 2,800 feet. So where um, the, the Bodega San Valero has about 3,800 hectares, this is 11,000 acres of vines. Um, and they've got vines that are about 30 years of age. And one third of theirs is the Garnacha. This is, of course, we've got Eric Cray in there who is on the, uh, the slide or the talk with us today. <laughs> Ellie is in this picture as well. I see a lot of chats coming through. I guess I do have control. And then we have uh, Bodegas Penisa. Um, Bodegas Penisa, there, if you can see, that is something that was actually founded in 1953. They rebuilt this winery in 2017. Um, as you can see, the architecture is extremely nouveau, uh, especially for this area. This is a remote area. Again, you're coming from Zaragoza, which is uh, about a 45 minute to an hour ride into the middle of this desert kind of landscape. And then you come upon this wonderful, uh, this winery and it's just surreal almost. It's beautiful, it's, it's just elaborate and gorgeous. Um, they were originally called Nuestra Senora de Aguila Winery Cooperative. As you can see, Panisa is a lot easier to uh, say and it looks a little easier and um, more cohesive on the wine label. They are made up of 300 growers um, and they are in the southern part of the DO and uh, they've got about 6,900 acres and they are at the highest elevation. So as you go south, it gets a little higher elevation for wine growing. They're 2,300 feet. So as you get higher, the stones get a little bigger, soil gets a little less uh, filled with the nutrients 
and um, the garnacha becomes even more of a uh, high tendency to be seen. So this is moving back into the region of um, uh, Zaragoza. This is the main city. If you've never been, it's a sight to behold. Uh, this is the Basilica de la Pilar. Obviously, this is at night. Um, this is right on the Ebro River. And if you can kind of zoom in a little bit or take a closer peek, you can see a lot of the influence of the Moors here. Um, obviously, the Roman architecture of the aqueducts. And I know Rick has been here as well, so I'll let him speak a little on this. Yeah, so this, this um, um, the, I think the, the, the full name is the Basilica del Pilar de la Nuestra Señora. And what's fascinating about this is that back in 40 AD, the people of the local people um, thought that they saw a vision of Mary. And, um, and when they did, they decided to build um, a cathedral on top of it. And so obviously... Uh, to Kat's point, there is some Moorish influence. So there are, I mean, there are a couple of different styles that are part of this, um, but it's absolutely spectacular. I, I think, you know, uh, for those of you who have, who have been to Zaragoza, um, this sits right on the Ebro River, and, and it really is um, a spectacular sight to see. So, um, Kat, I think you've been to both of these places. I haven't been here, so I'll let you kind of pick up from here. So if you've been to Spain or you know about Barcelona and Madrid, those are kind of the uh, nouveau, there's all the greatest uh, Michelin restaurants, the cuisine is very fancy in some of the, some of the restaurants. In Zaragoza, it is, you walk in, you get a lot of tapas, you get a lot of the sort of very familial feelings and... Um, that, that's kind of the scene with the, the food and the cuisine. And then you look around and you get this architecture. Again, Moorish influence is abounding, as you can see uh, the slide on the left. Um, this, uh, <laughs> this is kind of an interesting spot. This is where all of the Inquisition happened. So if you're wondering where most of the uh, people got their heads chopped off, it is right here. Um, which is probably not a great thing to have to think about, but um, just acknowledging the presence of the, the lines and the structure and the lighting and what they were able to do and construct and the marble and all of the, the layout of these uh, areas. And it's huge. I mean, it's, it's hard almost to even like see just how glorious this is. And um, just from this one photo, I wish we could send you all of the pictures that we have. And then you jump over to the slide on the right. And this fountain, again, it's hard to see just how amazing the architecture is with this fountain. Um, this was constructed just a couple years ago. And it's the, the sort of futuristic coming into the present and how Zaragoza is trying to fuse those keeping the history as well as bringing the future and bringing them into the present and kind of uh, having that lifestyle there for the people that live there as well as anybody coming into the area. Uh, oh, and the tapas. I think this might be a moment I would invite Mr. Crane just to take a, a step to talk about his favorite tapas that he so readily <coughs> wanted us all to indulge upon. I'll be honest with you, uh, Kat, as much as anybody, I love a fried Twinkie, but they don't have them uh, in any measure in Spain. I'm sorry, Spain. So uh, these are uh, the croquetas and everything else that we enjoy with great aplomb. So yeah, croquetas in Zaragoza are one of life's pleasures. Yes, we had um, given Eric a task of going to grab a few things from our little journey into the tapas bar. Now you walk down the streets and there's this open market and there's tapas all over the place that you can pick from. I mean, tapas of everything. <clears throat> so Mr. Crane comes back with about 17 different croquetas for us to choose from. Three each, I think there were. Uh -huh. Kat, if you, uh, have you ever been to an ice cream shop and they offer a taste of all the different ice creams and you say, I want a scoop of everything? 
that's yeah. kind of how I felt in El Tubo uh, yeah. on a Zerasoga night. So yeah, pretty special stuff. It is. Yeah. So the El Tubo, yeah. So El Tubo is what they call this special area. Uh, and it's not just for tourists. We were definitely amid the locale of the, uh, the people that live in Zaragoza. And it's just a magical experience walking up and down. There's people sitting, engaging with one another. There's a communal feel everywhere you walked. Um, it, it's really magical. It, it's, yeah, it's very magical. <laughs> yeah, Kat, you know, this reminds me a little bit, too. Uh, if anybody has been to Logroño in Rioja, um, uh, the Calle del Laurel, which is just, uh, you know, one long street with all these little side streets that has little tapas bars. You pop in, you grab a you grab a tapa, you grab a glass of wine, you move on to the next one. And, and it's very much, I mean, it is not, I mean, there are tourists there, but it's just like this. I mean, the food is spectacular. It's all a bunch of locals. It's great food, great wine, and, and best of yet, it's all cheap. It is good and cheap, and you I mean we can't eat like that anywhere in the U.S. <clears throat> to uh, to Kat's point earlier about, um, <clears throat> if I may, sorry, um, talking about the lack of vegetables in the area. So we did. Uh, we were lucky enough to go dine in what is one of the oldest restaurants continually operating in all of Spain in uh, Zaragoza in uh, El Tubo. And um, we, we looked at, they were famous for their vegetables. We looked at their uh, vegetable uh, prefix menu. And the first course was all vegetables. The second course had foie gras in it. The third course had ham. The fourth course had foie gras in it. And it just, it, it kind of speaks of their lack of understanding of what a vegetarian is in this area of Spain. I don't mean that in a negative way. I, I, I was very happy. Some of the vegetarians were not, but um, it's a really, really special part of, uh, of the country. It's a great part of Spain. And now, a word from our sponsor. Looking to be in the know about Dracaena wines? Want to know when we release our new wines? Find out about all of our accolades and get some behind-the-scenes information? Well, all you need to do is sign up for our newsletter. There is no commitment necessary, and I promise you we won't spam your mailbox with loads of messages. Need another reason to sign up? Quite possibly the best reason? You will immediately get a code for a special discount on all of our wines and be privy to newsletter-only specials. Let Dracaena Wines turn your moments into great memories. Sign up simply by heading to our website, dracaenawines.com, and fill out the pop-up or sidebar. It will take less than a minute of your time, but the rewards will last forever. So we're going to, so now I think you guys are probably tired of listening to Kat and I talk and that I, wine that's been sitting in your glass that you've been kind of like almost trying to shake to stay away from, you're ready to start guzzling. Um, I mean, I, Kat and I are both on West Coast time and uh, so, I mean, it's never too early for a glass of wine, especially for those of you who are drinking kava. Um, I mean, I did a, I did an interview on uh, earlier in the week, and and uh, it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. I was like, bring out the kava, let's go. Um, so we're gonna do, we're just gonna share with you guys a couple of the wines that we're tasting, and then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna pull the presentation down, and we're gonna open it up, and would love to have everybody chime in to, you know, what are you trying, what do you like, what's uh, tell us a little bit about your wine or, or whatnot. So Kat, why don't you go ahead and start with your kava? Righty. Well, again, salute to everybody. Um, I'm in Las Vegas, so I think everybody knows now what Las Vegas feels like every day. You don't know what day it is. It's okay to drink whatever time it is. Yeah, it's pretty good. So, um, Monte Duque Brut Cava. This comes from Bodega San Valero. So, Monte Duque, again, this is coming from a soil type. This is from a specific region of soil type. So it's that really rocky, big stones, extreme conditions, really huge diurnal shifts. So extreme climatic conditions, really hot during the day, drops down cool at night. That's where they're really harvesting some of the, the or all the grapes for this uh, kava. And this is made traditional style kava, 15 months on the leaves, really fabulous. You've got your three traditional grapes, um, Perriada, Perriada, Chirello, and, and Macabeo. Perriada, Chirello, and Macabeo. Sorry. Um, 
And I think what happens when you get your really truly indigenous grapes in these great uh, alluvial soils is they work well together. You're getting a creamy texture, you're getting that zingy acidity, and it's fun and it's fresh. Um, and, and I think that's what this is meant to be. It's not supposed to be, oh my gosh, let's pontificate on the seriousness of the world. I think this is meant to be drank and it's meant to be a great food pairing and the price is amazing when these wines are finally released. So, salud, I'd love to hear more from what you guys want to say. Is anybody drinking the Cava that wants to share? Am I the only one that was lucky enough? I think Jeff had it. Some participants have um, the particular Blanc de Noir, not this particular Cava. So it's oh, like- Oh, and then I could keep uh, talking all day about it. It's great, <laughs> I love it. Aha. Uh-huh. So, you know, when it comes to Cava, I think maybe just kind of talking about how Cava um, in this region uh, doesn't really get the notoriety because most people consider Cava to come from that one area. Uh, that we will not name, but Cava in Aragon <laughs> is fabulous. And coming from a region like Catarina, I think it does very well. Um, but I think uh, if we can maybe discuss the particular real quick, because it's a juicy, fabulous little style. Sure, I'm off mute. So <laughs> can I uh, offer just a little bit? Well, so I have, the, per- I have the particular um, and... Um, so this is uh, Blanc de Noir, so it's 100% Garnacha, and um, it's Brut Nature. Um, and um, I'm actually enjoying it with, um, like everybody, I'm doing some bread baking, so i got a little focaccia today. Um, nice. But I was really surprised, really pleasantly surprised um, at, at Brut Nature. So there's there's no dosage, no excuse me, no dosage. Um, but it's... Um, it's from a little bit warmer place than Chad. And so um, it's generous and it tastes like it doesn't need any dosage. Um, super friendly and delicious and, yeah, really nice. Does anyone else have a cava on the, the chain here? James, you had the Mont Duquet too, right? Yeah, I had the Mont Duquet uh, and also the Particular and uh, Lovely Styles. They were both Brut Nature. Um, is that the dominant style in Aragon? I have not seen anything different so far. I don't know if I could speak to that with confidence to say it's the dominant style, but everything that I see coming out says seems to say Brut Nature. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, I don't recall seeing anything outside of Brut Nature, but I think they were just kind of making wines from a co-op point of view for what people were asking for. It didn't really seem like, I didn't see a range of wines. They only kind of seemed to have like a favorite flavor. From my experience when we were there, Kat. I mean, Chrissy or Ellie might have a different uh, view on that. I think they're also here. Okay, so I had the particular too, and it's just really clean, clean and fresh and nice and zippy. And I want some fried food right now. I want, I want some. <laughs> I yeah. love it, Chrissy. You want to share your other wine, right. Kat? Sure. So going to something that is truly indigenous to the region, I have the Monasterio 2016 Old Vine. So again, Old Vine, no true definition, but we're going to say it's somewhere between 30 and 100. I'm going to go 100 years. Um, But uh, this is about 40 years of age. And to me, this kind of is a, a fun little treat. I put my nose in it like such. And it reminds me of those uh, those little candies. They were kind of like those um, those uh, raspberry caramels, where you had the, the caramel on the outside, that cream on the inside. I don't know. Maybe I'm just old or something. But that's what it makes me think of when I smell it. And then when I taste it, it kind of supports all of that. It's this chocolate covered raspberry, but then the herbs really just sweep through, and that's been an, a, a very um, trendy kind of thing that I've noticed as I've been focusing on the wines here from Carinina is the herbs that come through and we definitely got to see a lot of those brush uh, kind of coming up as they were growing through the vineyards and I, I definitely think they have an influence on the wines. So the garnacha here is sun-soaked, it's drenched and yet the acid is still kind of coming through as this is grown in that very poor nutrient soil. Which one is that, Kat? 
The Monasterio. A oh, wine garnacha. Anybody else drinking the Monasterio? Or a Monasterio? Uh, Monasterio Reserva, 2015. No. Cool. What do you think, Tom? Um, it's huge. It's a, it's, it's a leg of lamb dinner. It's, a, it's massive. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a four grape blend, uh, Garnacha, Tempranillo, Carignana, and um, Cabernet. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's warm. It's 14.5, but it's not an off-putting hot. It's, um, it just gives you a lot of oomph. And uh, pretty well-made wine, if what I wouldn't find online, it's not very expensive, so it's a pretty good bargain, I think. And for people who like American, you know, big ripe Zinfandels and things like that, this would be a big hit for them. Okay, it's one of the, that's one of the selling points in, in, you know, for this region, too, is that they're not a pricey region. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I tell people all the time that I think Spain well undervalues itself in the vast majority of areas by underpricing its wines. And I tell I tell presidents of the DO that you should be raising your prices. <laughs> not that this is the time to do that uh, for anybody. But I think that, you know, to your point that you can have there, I mean, and there are wines, even just what you guys are tasting, there are wines that, that range in style that, that are attractive to a vast audience. And it's still delicious, too. It's just a really tasty, tasty wine. Especially with the Lego lamb. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'll share my, my two that I've got real quick. So um, I pulled the, the share off just so we, I could see you guys. It's much more fun for me to see you guys and engage that way. So I have the Anayon uh, Garnacha. It is a 2015, um, and both of the wines that I'm I'm tasting today are uh, grown at those highest elevations in the region, up around 22 and 2300 feet. Um, and this is, I mean, this is just classic Garnacha. It's it's got red fruits. It's spicy. It's got some herbs in it. It has really really nice, real fresh acidity. Um, mm. But it's a big wine, to your point, Tom, it's 14 and a half as well. Yeah. And, but it doesn't taste like it. And that's one of the things that I, you know, I'm really, I'm finding more and more about, especially the garnacha that's produced in Carignana and in Aragon, that they don't taste heady and they're not, they don't feel monstrous. Um, I mean, it, it, obviously it's a wine you want to have with food, but it's 2.30 in the afternoon and I'm in between lunch and dinner and I'm still having a glass and I'm, I'm okay with that. So, um, so anybody else drinking? I think Trish, you're drinking the Anion Carignana, right? I am. Yes. It's uh this is a little old. This is the 2013. They're currently on the 2015, but I had this in my cellar. So yeah, I mean it's what you think of Carign, you know, the Carignan grapes. So it's a little on the green side. It's a little tight. Um, but it's got it's got 10 months in French oak, um, and I think that's you know, giving it kind of a nice, sweet, a little bit of a, a sweeter, softer uh, finish to it. So it's very nice. I mean, it's also, you know, this is also a fairly big wine for, it's 14%. But again, like, and I'm generally very sensitive to alcohol, like high, those levels, but it's nice. It's, uh, it's really well balanced. Okay. And then my last one here, and I, I got to tell you, I love these wines because of the labels. This is the Fabula. And apparently this, this, uh, somebody asked a question on here about, um, you know, brands and, and co-ops. And so, you know, there are typically branding, uh, you know, co-ops have multiple brands and then within their brand, they have multiple labels. And so uh, this is just one of those examples. And this, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, this is one of their, their story is that these are all taken from fables. And so every, every wine has a different, uh, um, image on it and so yeah so like steph's got the the rosado that looks like it's got a flute on it the suitcase from lori um and so it's really kind of a fun i mean and you know i think this is i mean this is one of the kind of wines that somebody will walk into the wine shop and pull it off the shelf because it's got a cool label and then they'll be willing to try it plus i'm sure it's not super expensive anyways but this is a 2018 carignana um and to trisha's point um, it, it is a little on the greener side. It's still uh, this one. The, uh, the Grenache that I had was grown in those really big stony soils. This one here is a little bit more of a mix of limestone and clay and schist. And um, but it, it's 14 uh, percent still has a but it has kind of more a little bit of red and some of the black fruit notes to it. But uh, really, I mean, very, very pleasant, very easy drinking wine. And again, another wine that doesn't feel 
like it's at 14%. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not sensitive to high alcohol wines. I just can't drink as much of them um, at the same, at one sitting. But, uh, you know, for the most part, it, I mean, it's a really easy drinking wine. So um, with that, I want to open it up and we want to hear well, from you guys and share what uh, Eric. Yeah, go for I've, it. Uh, I've got another uh, Garnacci here. It's the uh, celebrities label. Um, I, I'm not insensitive to, uh, or I'm insensitive to high alcohol wines. This is also 14.5, but it, like just from a, a growing point of view, this area, this is a desert. This is Thai desert. It's, it's very easy for the grapes to creep up in ripeness levels, which would, uh, give these high alcohols. And much to the point, many of these are made in a very, very fresh style from a winemaking point of view. So even though this, uh, you know, technically if it came from, the New World 14.5 would be a total bruiser. It's incredibly lightweight, very easy to drink, uh, 100% uh, Grenache, gro- or Garnacha, my bad, grown on those, uh, those, uh, nah, man, I, uh, yeah, it's like, like, you're really good at the commercial. Everybody calls it Grenache. Look at a uh, tissue or Kleenex. It's one of those things. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a super fun, easy to drink bottle of wine, as, as many of the wines of the region are. Really, really fun stuff. Um, when we were there, uh, really, I, I always thought that our over uh, overwhelming majority vote was, man, these are easy to drink wines. And for something that can occur at all alcohol levels, grape varietals, everything, it's just basically focused on crowd pleasing and, and deliciousness. Anybody else? I'm gonna, let's, uh, and I'm not going to call on people. We're not in we're not in a classroom, um, but I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking and what you're drinking and. Um, I mean, this is, you know, it's happy hour. Everybody's supposed to get a little toasted and start talking more. I okay, I'll this. share. Oh, okay. You know, so, oh. Can you see, if you can see it here? The Paz Panizza. <laughs> your, background, your background's getting in the way there, Gabe. <laughs> Beaujolais yeah. is eating it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's the Venus Viejas de Panizza. Um, 100% Garnacha. 14% alcohol, but I was surprised. It has a softness to it that I really like. E- easy drinking, but it's got depth. Mostly red fruit, but like there's a bit of black fruit in there too, and lo- lots of herbs, and uh, just really, really delicious and easy going. I like it a lot. I don't know what the price point is, but it's very tasty. It's, I like that wine. I like that wine a lot. I think, is it Casley? Did I pronounce that right? Castlea. Castlea. <laughs> Cast okay. is fine too. Yeah. This is so cool. I'm learning so much. And you guys are making this region like move really high up on the bucket list. This is amazing. Um, <laughs> so I'm having um, Corona de Aragon Garnacha. And um, it's 2018. It's only 13.5. So it doesn't feel hot at all. Um, it's beautiful, crisp red fruits, nice earthiness, fresh herbs, floral. It's nice acidity. I'm loving it. It's very drinkable. <laughs> Super. Yes, and I have I have the same bottle. Cool. What do you yeah. think, Lisa? Yeah, I like it a lot. I like that it's thirteen and a half percent. It's it has a lot of great herbal notes. Um, you know, it still tastes. I mean, it's, mine's a twenty eighteen. It has, definitely has that young fruit taste, but it's refreshing. And it also, also, are you getting like a little bit of like a chalky feel in your mouth? When For you sure. Drink? There's definitely like some minerality on that. Yeah. 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 It's good. Mm-hmm. I love it. So I'll go. I have a 2019. So Ooh, this is nice. a this is a youngin, um, and it's Syrah. So Ooh. I'm really curious about the label because when I saw your the heart one, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But mine is a suitcase with with a vi- with grape vines all around it. Yeah. So yeah. I'd be really interested in knowing what the story behind it is. But the other thing I like is the little saying next to it says, and being cosmopolitan and refined, she established the personality, the true personality here. And so I'm taking that as this is the terroir. This is exactly what, you know, minimal uh, intervention. And this is what the fruit is saying. Um, It is a little, it is young. Um, but it is 14% alcohol. And if I was blind tasting, I wouldn't have guessed that. Um, it doesn't taste like 14, um, but it's, it's a lot of red fruit. Um, and I think that, you know, aerating it, letting it, you know, get a little older in the glass a little bit 
it will become even more beautiful of a wine, but you can sense that it's going to be a very nice wine. So, hey, Drupal. this is Drupal. Hi, thanks for doing this, especially after a long day. This is exactly what I needed. Mm -hmm. But I have the Monasterio, and it's actually a 2015. So I'm guessing it's kind of softened a little bit. Um, it's still a really, really big wine, lots of fruit. Um, I love it for its price point. I think it's around 14 or $15, so I think it's a great deal. Um, lots of good fruit, but well-balanced. The alcohol doesn't seem that high, um, but, it, but it is around 15 and a half, 14 and a half. So, um, but really enjoyable and drinkable and juicy. And I'm not a big fan of big wines, but this is, it's, it's really nice, really nice. And did, do you know if it has um, a little any oak aging on it? Because, I mean, the fact um, that it's a five-year-old wine and it's still drinking really fresh and really Yeah, good. yeah. Let me see. I, I had the... I think it has like a um, a, a year oak, I believe. I have the same yeah. bottle. I think it does. Okay. Is it the old vine or the... It's an old vine. I think it's like... It, it should have about four months at least. Okay. New oak, yeah. What yeah. do you think, JC? What do you think? Great. I think it's definitely a big, a big, very big red. Um, I love that I can taste the red berries and the blackberries on it. Um, it's 14.5, so um, I, I'm a, about a glass and a half in, and I definitely feel that. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. <laughs> well, if you're, yeah, close to um, Jeff, if you're close to Jeff, he's got some uh, fresh baked focaccia that he just made. So. Yeah, you could you um, could kind of soak it up with that, and and, uh, nice. and yeah. it's amazing. I always find it amazing, you know, that the twelve it's twelve percent when I'm you know I'm well into the I've made some progress on the bottle, and it's just like twelve percent is fine, fourteen percent gets you pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so yeah, you could yeah. or you could have a you could have a sip with the focaccia as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to pair it. I definitely want to pair this wine with like a good, um, robust meat, lamb or steak. Mm. You know, one of the things that for me is fun with wines like this because they're not like super pricey as well is just mm -hmm. a really nice potted chili, you uh, know? Yeah. Um, because there's just, I mean, and when I make my chili, I use like three or four different meats, you know, types of meat. Oh, there's so yeah. much different flavor in there. And, you know, you put a little, uh, you know, I use a little, you know, sweet and bittersweet paprika from Spain. And, you know, all of these notes that they just kind of integrate with, with, with wines like this mm -hmm. that are super easy to drink. And, you know, pretty much you've downed, you know, a bowl of chili and the bottle's gone already. And, uh, and you didn't realize yeah. that you were drinking it that fast. So <laughs> we have um, we have our resident Span we have our resident Spaniard here too, and he's uh, Javi. What would you be pairing? Um, I'm drinking wine from from Valencia. I couldn't get any Carnacha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should we I mute him it. and cut his camera, Trish? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Javi, I was just asking for some good pairings for a nice big red wine. Ooh. Oh, sorry. Um, patatas bravas, for example, yeah, croquetas that you talk about. Uh, Javi loves his patatas bravas. I love patatas bravas. <laughs> and tortilla. Yeah, con chorizo and... Javi, are you well, in Spain right now? Yeah, I'm in Madrid. Oh, you're in Madrid, okay, okay, gotcha. Anybody else want to share what they're drinking? I actually have the same, the same wine that you had, Kat, the old vines granacha. But yeah, let's hear about it. 2016. Um, and the funny thing about it is it has so much, like, depth and character and such fresh, crunchy food that you would think that the price would be a little bit more because it is a really high-quality wine and it has this beautiful virality and everything. So I was watching this really cool documentary last night called Rotten. I don't know if you've seen it yet. It's on Netflix. But they're talking about the comparison of pricing with Le Capricion and a lot of the regions from Spain, like Le Carignan going on between the pricing of this and these wines at this price point it was sad because only like six percent actually goes back to winemakers at this price point and we were saying how they should raise the price a little bit and lifts everybody up on that like wine quality level but uh yeah i think that this is only about 14 dollars yeah it's wow. insane right would anybody and and i mean this lovingly and i would anybody compare these wines to anywhere else 
regionally on the planet. I would, uh, <laughs> you know, for for a lot of like the Grenaches and and Carignans, or, or I'm sorry, uh, Grenache and Carignana, um, it reminds me a lot of Cote Rhone, to be honest with you, because the, the wines are really just kind of they're sourced from vineyards and the wines are made and they can potentially have high alcohols. I don't mean, mean that in a bad way because I think for years as, as American wine industry uh, folks, we've always told people when they're looking for something different, Cote Rhone is such a great way to start in terms of expanding your horizon for different wines made from different grapes. I just, these are a really good stepping stone for, for getting people who are maybe new to wine uh, drinking into Spain, there, there's something just really like fresh and pure about these. That's 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 what I recommend. But that's also me, Kat. So you know, I think that's a good point too, Eric. Because I think you know, for somebody who's looking for a really good baseline profile of Garnacha, the Garnat the 100% Garnacha from here is is very is very baseline from the standpoint that it does give you those the the standard characteristics of what that grape is supposed to do. Uh, with yeah, yeah. Intervention and minimal minimal aging versus other other parts of France, for example, that might you know have all you know all these aging and everything. It's just it's a great it's it's a great way for people to get introduced to a grape. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's not even so much for like introduction to Garnacha, but maybe introduction to a country because like like the same way that I I, I would use Cote de Rome that you're used to maybe drinking New World wine, so wines with pronounced fruit, pronounced alcohol. These are grapes that grow in an area that, that will have that richness and have that body and have the alcohol and maybe what you're looking for. But it's a great way to get somebody with what they're looking for away from oak. And a lot of times, like with the New World, they're, they're getting alcohol richness and also oak. And we're seeing less of it here or maybe oak use in a much more neutral style or a traditional style. So it's, it's, it's a lot easier for maybe consumers to wrap their head around something they weren't necessarily thinking about uh, beforehand. And the I, I, is right. these are great. These are gateway wines. It, uh, you know, if I can drink this with you, then I can uh, crack open something else, and we'll both be happy. Anybody else want to share anything? I did have the opportunity to, to sample some uh, uh, Carinena based Carinena wines. I don't know about a year ago, mm -hmm. um, and they. The one thing I would say is they were. They did have. All of the styles represented, there was one that was quite modern, international in style. And when you're saying not too much oak, it's like, no, this would be a great, this would be a great bridge for somebody who really likes an oaky wine, um, you know, an internationally styled wine, where some of the others were more traditional. Um, I certainly, I certainly liked them. The big challenge for me is, at least in Minnesota, I don't see these on the shelves. Uh, you know, we have, we have, we have certainly have some Spanish wines, but. I've never seen anything from Carinania on the shelves here. No, it's great, the reality. It, no, you're right. The, you're right, Jeff. I mean, it's the reality of, 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 you know, of Spain in general, you know, it's trying to get, I mean, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, push to get exposure and, you know, right now it's a really hard time, you know, when, whether right. you're fighting with import percentages or, or now with viruses and, and, the reduct, you know, so I think that I think it's just it, it takes time, and I'm glad that you actually got a chance to taste some of that kind of stuff when, yeah, you, when you can't find it. Um, yeah. I don't see a lot of it in San. I see very little of it in San Diego as well, and so um, you know, it's it, you know, it's a little harder to when things things going going to the west, it's it a little harder to get things out as well. But uh, yeah. yeah, we see the we see the kind of the you know all of the big really well-known regions of course and then we have some small importers that are bringing in the their the very avant-garde and natural natural wines and kind of nothing in between yeah so well just have to hope for more commerce here <laughs> maybe it's time to open a wine shop jeff yeah. <laughs> quit the blogging and the no, that's right. <laughs> I hear direct imports are all the rave right now. <laughs> <laughs> Trish, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I know we've just hit uh, three thirty, or well, six thirty for most of you. But um, you know, well, we want to be respectful of your time. If anybody else has anything they want to share, though, please. Feel yeah, I'd just like to, to make a comment. I really think of um, this region as you know, in terms of the Carnacha being very. Um, a kinship to, say, Importa or Monsat or Dorato. I think there's that linkage that's there. It's not quite the same, but there's that familiarity, I think. 
completely agree. Especially, I would say to your point, James, especially Emporda um, and maybe Terra Alta. Um, because the, the styles, I mean, the, you know, the styles in Priorato and Monsant tend to be a little more extracted, you know, as they, you know, and, but I've found that there's a little bit of a lighter, fresher, uh, style that comes with, especially the wines from Emporda and the nor Northern part of Catalonia. So I, I completely agree with that. I, I would say from a natural wine point of view, this area is not wealthy. And because they're not wealthy, a lot of their practices are literally from the vineyard to the press, and we don't have a lot of bells and whistles. So if you have people that are, are looking for that natural wine movement or, or you know, to turn a consumer onto something or a customer, this is an area that is cash poor. And being cash poor, they don't have the bells and whistles of an established region like, say, Napa or Re even Rioja. So they're... The, this is about as natural as it gets. There were times that when we were lucky enough to be there, myself, Kat, Ellie, Chrissy on the call uh, or on the Zoom, like it's really hands-on. It, it is not a matter of let's do this or mass production, even from a co-op point of view. So if you have people looking for wines with minimal intervention, this is a really great area for that. Right, and and just to, to piggy on that, they're – some of the wineries are trying to establish as organic. I know Bodega San Valera is, has one of their um, productions as organic that's going to be coming out. Um, but most of their wines are already grown in organic soils. There's no pesticides being used. They're using these biodynamic principles to kind of get rid of the pesticides as it is. So, you know, I'm glad that Eric's bringing that up. As well. I'm known for my love of natural wine cats. So what do you guys think about the indigenous versus international varieties here? Yeah, I went there. I went back to Sirius because it's like kind of a, a looking at the Garnacha and the Carignina, which I love those wines from this region. And then looking at the Cabernets and the Lowe's, the Syrahs, which they're still fun and fresh and, and kind of like <laughs> reminiscent of like really like before I even knew that I would be a human Bordeaux styles of wines before there was oak influence and all that. I'm just wondering what you guys think. Because some of you had the Syrah, but some of you maybe have tried Cabernets that are from Spain and such. What do you guys think of those? I personally you know, like here's the an, here's an area if I may cat here's an area where it gets really warm and it gets really ripe and they don't have a lot of water so sometimes grapes that might have evolved in the region and with modern day winemaking uh, practices not that they're pumping in a bunch of technology in this re region by any stretch but sometimes grapes might do better that were never in the actual area the couple of cabernets that we had and I'm not a Cabernet drinker by nature, but the Cabernets we had, I thought were really, really drinkable for a lot of the level of, uh, of the pricing of these wines. Um, I, I think that because of the economy, it hasn't been explored as much as it should be. And maybe kind of that swing back to traditionalism because there are the international bridles there, but all the cabs I had, I was really taken with. There wasn't this green element just, just because of the, uh, the ripeness level. At the same time, it is the only region that is named after a grape. And the lack of Carignan or Carignana going on in this area, I think it broke all of our hearts because yeah. Yeah. We, we like and we, when we would find these really, really old Carignana vineyards, we would get so excited to be like, oh my gosh, this is like your name for all of this. So I think locally they really champion the cause, but from a from a, a viable standpoint economically. I would really think that they should investigate grapes like Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon that do well with uh, intense heat and, and long growing seasons and late ripening seasons. And this place has it in spades. So that's kind of my view on it. But uh, I did love having Tempranillo from the area and having Garnacha and having uh, Carignana and uh, all of the other grapes we had that were the, uh, the, the local hits or or how they evolved there almost. I really, I do enjoy international grapes from other regions in, in Europe, such as uh, Sicilia, Romania, um, Toscana. And I think there's a double-edged sword because those regions that sometimes do grow international varieties get some you know, back talk on that versus some respect. Um, and it's, why is it okay for the United States or Canada or Australia to do international varieties? 
but not some of the old world. Good point, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. I think one of the things that you've seen with Spain, though, is there are a lot of regions that, I mean, especially in this part of the country, that they are, they have worked a lot with international grapes, partly because they are, you know, during, after phylloxera, the French came over and brought a lot of their grapes, um, but also because of the, of the international popularity uh, of them trying to sell a wine on the market. I mean, for example, the, the wine region in Rueda, working with Verdejo, Part of the reason why they gained some of their popularity is because they threw Sauvignon Blanc in the mix and added yeah, yeah. The label and they were and they and they started to sell wine. And so I think that one of the things that you you saw in the past over the past couple of decades is that we got to we got to get our stuff out there. We got to make a name for ourselves. So we'll throw international varieties. But in Spain in particular, um, I've seen a huge shift now to into indigenous grapes, and there is a, a much bigger move towards actually um, working with local grapes because now a lot of these regions actually have some name recognition and people are looking for things that are local now. Um, I mean, I know for me, I love looking for the local stuff. And, and I think, you know, not, and it's not just wine geeks like us on here. I think general consumers are genuinely more interested now in what's local and what's there and what people are drinking there and making there. So it's interesting to see a little bit of that shift. You kind of said what I was going to say is I think like as a winemaker, you know, your, your passion is there and you want to make what your passion is. So like those indigenous grapes are what your passion is, but sometimes that doesn't pay the bills. Sometimes the workhorses pay the bills. So you have to go to those international varieties that people recognize and that it might be easier to export, you know, get into the United States because people recognize those names. And then once they recognize, you know, oh, here, here's a cab from this winery. Oh, wait, look at this cool, funky little grape variety that I've never had before. And it's from that same winery. I'm going to give that a try. And then you can introduce them to your true passion. That's what I do when I travel. I mean, it's easier to bring back something on onto a wine list in the past from a region such as this and uh you can kind of say okay well we've got a cab but i'm going to sneak in what should have been already on the list from that area the garnacha the carignan and kind of put that also there but the cabernet sauvignon typically will sell so much easier without my pushing it as a sommelier where the garnacha or the carignan, I'm going to maybe put it on a tasting menu or kind of offer it as a, a pairing or something. So Right. Or you sell them that first bottle easily. And then when they're looking for a second bottle, you're like, oh, well, you know, you liked that. I now have this. And it's a stepping stone into that. I just think it would be so sad if they pulled up all those, like, 50-year-old wines that have kept Cabernet because they're... Um, treasure of that area and mm -hmm. I just hope they don't do really, a I'm gonna follow this trend and that trend and like make moves too quickly because those wines are beautiful. Yeah I have a question if I can. I'm sorry. Um I also tasted the celebrity scarnacha which I loved. And I'm just wondering about the celebrities line and um whether that's intended to um appeal to say an american market with the varietal labeling and things like that yeah it's a it's a new line it's just come out 2019 is the first vintage um and yeah they're looking to appeal do but it's not just for the u.s i think they're they're doing it in spain too in the uk um but yeah i mean they're just they've had, to, to be honest they've had a new um director come in and he's got a lot of marketing background and he just saw, you know, he felt that, you know, there was a need to just spice up the marketing a bit. You know, they do kind of fun videos. The idea behind it was to make the grape, the celebrity, um, and then try to, you know, match each personality of the grape with, uh, an image. We yeah, have so it's a monovarietal line. I mean, they're, yes, and they're doing the international grapes, but they're also doing, and we push them very much, at least for the U.S. market. We felt they should really be focusing on um, the Garnacha and the Carniana, just because I do think that the retailers are now 
Yeah, I mean, it depends on the retailer, but I think the retailers now are more interested in indigenous, like what's different, right? Okay. If I'm going to take something, then let's have it, you know, a little, if it's coming from Spain, let's have it a little different. So I think this, this garnacha, it, well, first of all, the color was amazing. It was this deep, dark purple black. And, um, and I really, really enjoyed it. And I think it would appeal to, um, People who like, say, like a Napa Merlot, you know, something that's really rich and opulent and maybe not real high on the tannins, but super wine. I, I was really impressed with it. Thank you so much for putting this together. It was really yeah. I think it was love to oh, you. thank you. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Y'all y'all are really the best. It's uh we, we can't thank you enough for this experience. It's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you guys thank for, you for joining us today. today. Thank you for including me. It's been wonderful. I love you guys. Thanks, Laura. Bye. Bye, Christine. Bye. Bye, y'all. Gotcha. Have a wonderful day. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I'm also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com. If you enjoyed our podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher to help others find me more easily. Until next week, slancha.